crossing the Jordan to possess. As you know, the children of Israel, these were the people of God, and they were in Egypt, and they were in slavery, and God brought them out. He parted the Red Sea, and and they had this awesome victory, and then he said, hey, if you would just follow me, if you would just do what I tell you to do, I will bring you to the promised land. I'm going to bring you right into all that I have for you, and they got about a half a mile, and they said, you know what? I'm not feeling this. Over there looks a whole lot better than what God's telling me to do, and they said, hey, I'm going to do it my way, and for the next four 40 years they were stuck. They were unable to step into what God had for them. And finally, when that generation died off and God came to the next one, he said, hey, if you would just obey, if you would just observe the commands and the laws that I'm giving you, God says, I will make sure that you step in to all that I have for you. Can I ask you a question? Look at your life. See where you're stuck. See where you're not making progress. And I challenge you, and I almost promise you, there's an area in your life where you've failed to obey God. There's something that you've overlooked. There's something that you said, that's not a big deal. I don't have to love that person. I can still get to where I'm going, or or I don't have to deal with that, or I don't have to touch that. I can kind of just run off. And God is saying, I long to move you forward, but I can't move you forward because you're stuck at the last test that you failed. You're stuck at the last place that you said, God, in this situation, I'm going to be Lord. I'm going to be coach. I'm going to go where I want to go, and I'm going to do what I want to do. And God says, okay, but you're going to be stuck there as long as you wait to obey that last command that I've given you. And you know, the thing about God's commands, and I've said this before, don't you just wish that he would just give you the whole picture? You know what I mean? If you tithe, then I'm going to make you a millionaire within three weeks. Oh, bless God. I, I, I think that's nice. I, that's the best, especially in this economy. That's an awesome investment. I think, I think I'll go for that. If you would just submit and love that person as you love yourself, I will make sure that the power of God and the presence of God rest in your home and, and rest in that relationship. Okay, cool. I'm all for that. But no, sometimes he just says, get up and go to the land that I'm going to show you. Sometimes he says, this is just my command. I want to see what you're going to do with it. And sometimes it's the simplest thing. Like, go to church. Hebrews 10, 25, don't forsake the the gathering of the brethren. He said just a simple thing, and he wants to see, hey, are we going to say, okay, it's early, and I'm sleepy, and I was up all night, and I don't want to go, or are we going to say, God, even though I'm not feeling like it, you are the Lord of my life, and I'm going to do as you tell me to do. Can you turn somewhere with me? Turn to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. Hebrews chapter 11, verse verse 6. It's kind of in the back. Easiest way would probably to be find the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and just start turning right, and you should run into it. And just do me a favor. Shout, yeah, when you got it. It's a couple people. If you don't got it, say, wait for me. We'll wait for you. Hallelujah. Or it's on the screen. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. You got it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Hebrews 11, verse 6 says this, and without faith, It is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. He said without faith, it's impossible to please God. You know what our issue with with obedience? The only reason if there's ever an area in your life that you don't obey God and just to help you out, everybody has an area in their life that they haven't fully surrendered to God. The only reason that is, is because we don't have full faith in God, that he is who he said he is, and that he's going to reward those who diligently seek him. I grew up, I I have a a good number of brothers and sisters. We can uh, have our own basketball team, and we were hoping for some reserves, but our parents were like, nah. But I remember when we were young and my mom, she didn't know, but she would go out to the, the grocery store wherever and she would leave us and, and we would take our, our, our youngest brother or sister and we would put them up on the table or, or we'd put them on the step and, and we'd step back about three feet and we'd just stick out our arms. And they'd look at us like, whoa! And they would just take off running and jump and we would catch them and thank God we never dropped them except one time. And, He bounced a couple of times, so it was okay. (laughs) But 
they would jump and they, would, they wouldn't even think about it. They would just say, hey, he stuck his hands out. He must know what he's doing even though he's 12, but hey, let's just get this on. But we noticed that the older they grew, the more they were like, hmm, I don't know. Mm, I don't know about that. And by the time they hit like, you know, three, four, they're like, there ain't no way. I'm jumping. You know, the problem is that their faith in me, which is because they're smart, began to wane because they said there's no way they're going to be able to do what they're promising to do. Do you know the bottom line is when we refuse to obey God, we're really saying, God, I don't trust you. God, I don't really think that you are who you say you are. Can I, can I really step on some toes? Is that okay? Do you know that as singles, when we don't wait for marriage, we're really telling God, I don't think that you have the best for me. I don't, I don't really think you can deliver, so I'm going to go out and do it on my own. When, when we don't honor God with our lives, whenever area it is that we don't say, God, I'm surrendering this to you. I'm going to do it your way. What we're really saying is, God, I know that you created the universe, that you made me, that you keep me alive. I know that you've been around forever, but I just don't think you can handle this one situation. It's a matter of faith. And it's impossible to please God without faith. If you don't say, God, God, I'm going to take you as you are. God, I believe that you are who you said you are, and I'm going to do it the way that you told me to do it. There's no other way that you're going to walk out in obedience, and there's no other way that you're going to make progress in your life. And I believe that God's given us two simple tests to say, hey, are you going to take me at your word? Are you going to believe me? Are you going to obey even though it's inconvenient? Or are you going to step back and watch? There's two things I believe that he's given us. The first is baptism. And the second is tithing. Somebody say, ouch. The first is baptism, and the second is tithing. And I believe that God has given us as the people of God those two tests to ask one question. Who runs this show? Honestly, okay, that's not spiritual. Who's the Lord of your life? <laughs> no, who runs the show? He put baptism and tithing there for us to say, hey, I'm telling you, and I don't mean to scare you guys, but the water ain't warm. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> You know, there's Christians that, that sneak out at night and they cut a hole uh, in the ice and they get down and they get baptized in ice water because it's illegal to be a Christian where they are. So we wanted you guys to have that same experience. So, uh, but honestly, there's, there's nothing more inconvenient to your flesh than getting dipped in some water when you're fully warm, it's cold outside, and this is just not convenient. Amen. There's nothing more inconvenient than your paycheck taking out 10% the second that you get it. But this is what God is saying. Do you trust me? Do you allow me to run things in your life? Or do you trust yourself and your own ability to survive? And I want to give you three things, a couple things about baptism and a couple things about uh, uh, tithing. The first thing is this. In Hebrews chapter 6, Verse 1, it says this, Therefore, let us leave the elementary teachings of repentance from the acts that lead to death and of faith in God, instructions about baptisms, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. The writer of Hebrews was saying, there's these elementary things that we have to get by before we're able to mature in Christ. And the, one of those things that are elementary is this, the doctrine of baptisms. The doctrine of baptisms. And you might want to write this down somewhere. We're going to get a little teachy for a second. Is that okay? Do you know that there's not one baptism, but there's three? What's the third? Everybody knew there was two. Do you know that there's three baptisms. The first baptism is this. The first baptism is the baptism of salvation. The baptism of salvation. Let me read you a verse. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 verse 13 says this, for we were all baptized by one spirit with one God. When you give your life to Christ, you don't realize that you think that it's just a simple prayer. But what actually happens is when you say, God, forgive me of my sins, come into my life, be my Lord and Savior, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit actually baptizes you and regenerates you and makes you a brand new person. 
That's why it takes faith and not sight because a, a little simple prayer, you're like, there's no way that simple prayer can make it for the life that I've lived. But you don't understand that that simple prayer activates the Holy Spirit and now joins you with what Christ did on the cross and makes you a new person. The first one is the baptism of salvation. The second one is this, baptism in water. You know, baptism in water to our eyes, it just seems almost like it's just a public declaration or it's a ceremony telling the whole world, hey, I'm connected to Christ, but it's so much more than that. Let me read this. Romans chapter 6 verse 4 says this, we were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Jesus Christ was raised from the dead, the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Do you know what water baptism is all about? Water baptism is about joining Christ in his death and also joining him in his resurrection so that all that he took hold of when he came back to life, we now have access to in our lives. When you go down under that water that's representing, that's you joining, I'm dying to myself. Galatians chapter 2 verse 20 says, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And when you come back up out of that water, you come back up joining with Christ in the resurrection of who he is as our Lord and Savior. Somebody say amen. But how many people know that when Jesus came out of the tomb, he wasn't the same Jesus that went in the tomb. He went in with the sins of the world on his shoulders, but he came out with the glory of God and the power of God on his life. It's the same thing in water baptism. When you go down, you go down as an old man, but when you come up, you come up with the glory of God on your life, with the power of God in your life. Your old life is severed. Somebody shout amen. amen. All of a sudden, you're conscious. All those things are no longer able to torment you. The guilt, the shame of who you used to be, it was left in that tomb or it was left in that water. I am no longer who I used to be. Come on now. In the eyesight, it just looks like some water, but in the spirit, God says there's a supernatural work going on in your life. The baptism of water. The third baptism is this, the baptism in the spirit. Matthew chapter 3 verse 11 says this, I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me will come one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not fit to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Now, you know, whenever people get to the Holy Spirit and the baptism and all this kind of stuff, you're kind of just like, hold up. What's this going to happen? Because everybody, almost everybody, has just seen some pretty goofy, wacky stuff. Anybody seen some crazy stuff? Two, three, one. I remember my, my best friend, uh, he, he went to this church, and uh, he, he, I don't really know if he knew what was going on, but the pastor gave an altar call. He said, anybody who wants to be filled with the Holy Spirit, come on up. And he was like 12, and he, he goes on up. And as soon as he goes on up, they pray for him, and he didn't catch whatever he was supposed to catch. I don't know what he's supposed to catch, but he didn't catch it. So they took him to the back room, and, and they're rubbing on him, and they're praying over him. And he's like, oh, my goodness gracious, where did I get stuck? And he's sitting there literally for over an hour, and they're telling him, say this over and over and over again. And then finally, it's going to turn into tongues. He's 12, right? And finally, his father, who's a pastor, came in and said, hey, uh, I've got to go. Just make something up and let's get out of here. <laughs> Honda, Suzuki, uh, <laughs> Kawasaki, 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 <laughs> whatever it may be. But so many times when it comes to the baptism of the Holy Spirit, people have seen some pretty goofy things, some pretty wacky things. And we say, I don't want anything to do with that because I don't want to be associated with what's going on. But you know what Jesus said about the baptism of the Holy Spirit? And I'm telling you, I'm spirit-filled. I believe in speaking in tongues and all that different kind of stuff. But Jesus never put emphasis on tongues. When he was talking to his disciples, he said, hey, go to the upper room so you can receive what? Power. 